All right, friends, welcome back for more chapters of The Starfisher by Lawrence Yep. We're going to be starting with chapter five. Now, if you remember, the last things that we heard was that after Mama almost burnt the house down with her poor cooking skills, we had some neighbors who weren't very friendly who painted Go Home on their fence. And finally, to get her little sister to go to sleep, Joan told her the story of the starfisher. So let's see what happens in chapter five. We woke up when we heard the hoe scratching the dirt. Since Mama always got up early, I figured it had to be her. Emily yawned and then clacked her teeth together. <sighs> Why is Mama digging so early? Who knows? I nudged my little sister. Come on, get up. But Emily merely pressed her face into the pillow and tried to sleep some more. The pillow was feeling so soft and warm that I would have liked to have gone back to bed, too. But I kept hearing that persistent scratching noise, like a big chicken clawing the ground for worms. Scrape, scrape, scrape. So I slipped out of bed, but that floor was cold, and wound up walking on tippy toes over to the window. Taking a corner of the old window shade, I raised it to peek out. Down below, I could see Miss Lucy in a plain gingham dress and a kerchief tied up around her head as she chopped viciously at a weed. Miss Lucy gets up earlier than Mama. Her curiosity aroused, Emily burrowed out of the quilt and crawled on her knees to the edge of the bed so that she could look out with me. Then she plopped backwards on the bed. Then I'd better sleep for both of them. Getting Emily up was like trying to push a slow freight train up a hill. Seizing her wrists, I dragged her up into a sitting position. Come on, you don't want to be late for school, do you? Sure, she mumbled, and would have flopped back down if I'd let her. Already next door, I could see, I could hear Bobby banging around as he got ready. She sat like a little doll with half-closed eyes while I combed out her hair and braided it. Hastily, I put my own hair into practical pigtails and got dressed. Emily tried, I'll give her that much. However, by the time I was finished, she'd only managed to put her head and one arm into her dress. Frustrated, I stuffed my feet into the shoes and had just finished lacing them when Mama called out, Joan, come down here. I'm dressing Emily, I shouted back. I managed to find her other arm bent like a bird's wing inside her dress, and between the two of us, we got it through the proper sleeve, straightening her clothes hastily. I banged on the wall. Bobby, I yelled. Help Emily with her shoes. And then I went down the steps two at a time to see what Mama wanted. She was in the kitchen where she had laid out some pennies all in a row. Buy something to make sandwiches for lunch, she said. Though Mama was not particularly taken with American bread, she had quickly seen its usefulness in making quick meals. I swept the coins onto one palm. That's barely enough for a loaf, Mama. Mama was trying to distract herself from her worries by polishing the stove. I know, but... We haven't had any customers yet, and the move took most of our money. Well, I heard the sound of Miss Lucy's hoe outside. Couldn't we borrow from Miss Lucy? Your father is a proud, learned man, Mama insisted. We don't borrow. I figured out what Mama was really up to. Mama was too ashamed to go herself, so she was sending me. Why do I have to go, Mama? Mama straightened as if I'd just smacked her. Because I tell you. She scolded me. At home, a girl does what she's told. I know it sounds silly, but I think at that moment I saw my mother for the very first time. Not as the all-powerful woman who could handle anything, but as a human being, a small, frightened, vulnerable woman, alone in a strange land, except for her not always too grateful family. And knowing that Mama did not have magical powers made me feel grown up and sad and angry all at once. I should have kept my mouth shut, but I couldn't help blurting out. We are in America, Mama. And you're getting just as spoiled and just as lazy as an American brat, Mama snapped. The pennies were tight in my fist. That's not fair, Mama. We have more chores than American children. Mama reared back indignantly. Don't you talk back to me. Mama and I might still have been arguing, but Papa heard us and came in at that moment in an authentic, in an athletic shirt and pants. Can I have some tea, Mama? Glad of the excuse, Mama turned her back to me. It was a view that I got to see often enough. Papa took me by the shoulders and turned me around. Now don't go giving your Mama a hard time. 
She's got enough to worry about. And anyway, he scolded me gently. We don't want a fight on our first week in our new home. We might have bad luck. Just go and get the bread. It was hard to refuse, Papa. I began feeling so guilty that I gave up any pretense of pride. With my lips pressed tightly together, I barged out of the kitchen. But as I stalked down the hallway, I kept muttering, It's not fair. It's not fair. I slammed the front door so that Mama would know just how angry I felt. And outside, children were already trudging up the street towards school, and men and women were bustling towards work. They glanced at me curiously, but today my anger was my armor against their looks, and I ignored them. The store was already open. A huge sign over the storefront proclaimed to the whole world that it was Edward Edgar's Emporium. The store had a little bit of everything, from pairs of shoes to some shirts, bolts of cloth, jars of penny candy that made my mouth water, and all sorts of canned goods on shelves on the wall. Behind a counter was a man with long hair and a white shirt and tie, and over his pants he wore an apron. Black garters held up his sleeves. Uh, howdy, honey, he said brightly. Uh, you want some more crackers for your soup? I looked longingly at the candy and forced myself to take my eyes away. No, sir, I'd like some bread. Right. He wrote it down so he wouldn't forget. His pencil poised over the pad. And, uh, what else? Shamefaced, I noticed a sign on the counter, and I saw that the bread would take most of my money. I, I, have, to, I have to think. Got some nice cheese, sugar. Mr. Edgar set a loaf down upon the countertop and started to turn some foil-wrapped cheese. How, how much would you like? Fortunately, I saw the price. No, cheese makes my sister sick, I fibbed. Mr. Edgar began to tap his fingers on the countertop while I desperately tried to come up with a solution. The problem was that there was none. The tins of beef were out of the question, and so were many other cuts of the meat in the store. Even the bacon, if we could have cooked it okay, would still have cost too much. I turned slowly until I saw the vegetables setting in a row, each in their own basket with a little sign fixed to the front. The only thing that we could afford was a head of lettuce. I I I'll have some lettuce. Right, Mr. Edgar said, and wrote that down, too. His pencil poised over the pad. And what else? That's it. He scratched the tip of his ear with the end of his pencil. No, no tomatoes? No cucumbers? No. I kept my eyes right on the counter as I began to count out the coins. That's too plain an order for a salad, he sighed. We use the lettuce a lot in cooking, I lied. Well, do tell. I'd like the recipe sometime. Mr. Edgar held up the pad and pointed his pencil at the price, waiting for me to pay. The blood rushed to my face. I wished it were Mama or even Bobby going through this humiliation, not me. Slowly, I opened my hand, wishing each second that I could shrink small enough to crawl under one of Mr. Edgar's baskets. As I counted out the pennies, he shook his head. What was on your mother's mind? She should have given you more than that. He picked up the loaf. Tell you what, why don't you buy some nice apples instead? Nourishing and healthy... And if there's a worm, he winked, you even get a bit of meat thrown in for free. But it would be obvious to our schoolmates how poor we were if we just ate apples. I wanted our family to make a good impression on their first day. Uh, apples, worms, meat. And then he repeated it, hopefully. When I still didn't say anything, he complained in an aggravated tone. I don't think anyone in town would know a joke if they tripped over it. I smiled hastily. Oh, yes, I get it now. I'd like the bread and the lettuce. Mr. Edgar scratched the tip of his nose. Well, I'll tell you what. You look like you have an honest face, and I bet it runs in the family. Why don't you ask your father to come over? I could give him a little credit. However, I knew Mama was right. Being a laundry man was bad enough for him, but being a poor laundry man was even worse. I began to rummage around in the basket. No, sir, we, we don't believe in credit. Selecting a head of lettuce, I bought it over the counter. I brought it over the countertop. Well, hope your rabbit likes its meal, Mr. Edgar said, wrapping the lettuce and the bread in a brown paper bag. Rabbit? He sighed. Oh, it's another joke. Oh, yeah, yes, of course. When I slid the rest of the pennies onto the counter, I saw that I had been holding onto them so tightly that they had left the imprint of the little round circles on my hand, like the suckers of an octopus I had seen once in a fish market. Handing the bag to me, he nodded his head in a kindly manner. You keep what I said in mind and mention it to your father. Cheeks turning red, I thanked Mr. Edgar, and I hurried out of the store. Mama was still in the kitchen when I got back to the laundry. Well, 
she asked. I set the bag down on the table and I looked at her accusingly. I got the bread. Mama came over curiously. And? I rubbed at my palm. The impression left by the pennies was still there. I got what we could afford. Opening the bag, Mama peered inside. Lettuce? Well, that was it, I declared. It was like being a crewman on a boat just about to sink. Even though it would be a disaster for me, there was some satisfaction in knowing that the captain was going down, too. However, I should have known Mama better. Mama took out the loaf and the head of lettuce. Well, it's still more than I had back in China. We'll make lettuce sandwiches. While Mama washed the lettuce, I found a knife and I cut thick slabs of bread. It smelled almost like fresh baked, as if Mr. Edgar had gotten it that very morning. We had just put the sandwiches into the paper bags when Bobby and Emily came into the kitchen. This is important, Mama warned them. When you eat lunch, make sure you eat separately. Bobby looked at Mama as if she just told him to fly to the moon. Why? Emily was already suspicious. Peeking inside one bag, she lifted up the top piece of bread. Where's the sandwich? She demanded. There's only lettuce. It's a lettuce sandwich. Mama shoved her hand away and closed the bag again. It's good for you. It's rabbit food, Bobby said indignantly. Well, rabbits are very healthy animals, Mama argued. It's either lettuce sandwiches or empty air. Bobby and Emily each gave a grudging hug to Mama and stepped outside, where I could hear them greeting Miss Lucy. But Mama just kept her hands folded in front of her when I picked up my lunch and stepped out to her. You're the oldest, so you have to set the example. I'll try, I said. Don't try, just do it. Mama finally gave me a hug, but I didn't return it because I still hadn't forgiven her for making me do all the dirty work that morning. Chapter 6. On the brow of the hill sat the high school, a big three-story brick building surrounded by a large field and basketball courts. Emily and Bobby's grammar school began a little farther back, but it was almost the twin to the high school, as if they had both been built at about the same time. We'll meet there at lunchtime, I said, pointing to the fence that separated the two schools. With a final wave to Emily, I joined the river of boys and girls heading into the high school, where I stood uncertainly for a moment. To my left, I saw a tall stork of a girl, talking animatedly with two shorter girls who reminded me of pet poodles. Did you get permission to go on the choir trip to Washington? One of the smaller girls was asking. The tall girl shook her head, her blonde bangs drifting back and forth across her forehead. I'm still working on my mother. I walked over to them. Excuse me, I said. Do you know where the principal's office is? They eyed me with a curiosity that was not unfriendly, and the tall girl stretched out an arm to point. Uh, down that hallway and to the left. Encouraged, I lingered on. My name's Joan. Joan Lee. Havana Garrett, the tall girl said, and nodded to one of the shorter girls, who had a mass of brown sausage curls. And that's Henrietta Deems, she indicated a girl whose black hair had been pulled back into a bun and decorated with a red bow. And that's Flory Adams. Havana is an unusual name, I said. Yes, was Havana's curt answer, and then she was turning anxiously back towards Flory. I've just tried about everything to make her let me go. You know, we have to turn in the signed permission notes in two days, Flory pointed out. My mother said that I couldn't go unless you and Henrietta went. Same here, Henrietta chimed in. I stood there for a moment, wondering if I had offended Havana by asking so bluntly about her name, but she and her friends were engaged in such a heated conversation that I was afraid to interrupt. Instead, I waited for some natural break in the conversation, or for them to notice me again. However, either they were caught up in their problem, or they were determined to ignore me, because they didn't so much as glance my way. Well, goodbye, I said. No one acknowledged my existence. As I made my way to the principal's office, and it was small, with frosted panes of glass and wood paneling, books and hats lay piled on the shelves, and there were layers of papers on her desk, like the layers of a giant sandwich. In the center of the chaos was a stern-looking middle-aged woman in a white blouse and a long black skirt. She was broad, but not fat, like an overstuffed sofa standing on two legs, and her hair had been done up in a series of buns like layers of a cake. You must be one of Miss Lucy's new tenants, she said. I suppose there wasn't any secrets in a small town. Yes, ma'am. I'm Miss Blake. Bidding me to take a seat, she plunged her hand directly into the center of the mess upon her desk and extracted a file with the necessary form. In a polite but brisk manner, she helped me fill out the form. 
Now, where in China were you born? Actually, I said almost apologetically, I was born in Lima and added, Ohio, not Peru. She smiled patiently, <clears throat> as if she had already figured that out. Really? Well, that accounts for your English. I had cousins up there working in the locomotive factories. She handed me the form. Can you fill out the rest of this yourself? Of course, I said, and I took the pen from her. She watched as I wrote down my birth date. So you're 15? Yes, ma'am, I said, feeling as if there was some sort of unofficial test here. <clears throat> she watched the pen scratch its way across the page. We don't get to see many Chinese women coming in. I frowned as I tried to read and hold a conversation at the same time. My father is a scholar, and I think there's an exemption for them, I shrugged. I know there's one for merchants. Miss Blake looked puzzled. Is he going to open up a school? She was just being curious, I suppose, but I almost felt as if I were being interrogated. N no, ma'am. We have a laundry. Miss Blake smiled primly. Oh, then he's, um, not really a scholar. I slapped my pencil down so I could defend my father. Yes, he is. I was so annoyed that I began to fib. He's a very learned scholar, in fact. Uh, in indeed. She sniffed and turned to get a blank sheet of paper. Now, what courses did you take? Well, geometry, I said, and biology, and I named my other courses. You should be getting a transcript shortly. <laughs> indeed, Miss Blake said, and settled back in her chair. And just what do you intend to do when you graduate from here? Both Papa and Mama made noises about going back to China, but that event seemed as remote as Judgment Day. I'm going to go on to college. Indeed, she looked at me as if she had just said that I wanted, as if I had just said that I wanted to be the Queen of England. I felt that I ought to justify myself. I, I want to learn. <laughs> Indeed. I do, I asserted. Indeed. As I worked on the form, she finished a list of my classrooms, and when I was finished, she gave me something for my parents to sign. If they can't sign their names, Miss Lucy can help them. She acted as if I were fresh off the boat, and that attitude annoyed me. They can sign, I assured her. With a military stride, Miss Blake led me from the office and down a long hallway with a brown linoleum floor, past a display case for trophies, though there were only a few. Pausing by the door and one classroom, she knocked. Come in, a woman said. Beckoning me to follow her, Miss Blake opened the door and swept into a large room with wooden walls on which she hung big black chalkboards and a large map of Italy. Sunlight streamed in through the large frame windows into the desks made of wood and cast iron painted black. Each desk was fastened to wooden boards like a squat skier. As Miss Blake strode into the classroom, all of the pupils rose to their feet with a sound of thunder. Good morning, Miss Blake, the class said with one voice. Miss Blake ignored them as she went to the teacher standing with a blue book in her hand. The teacher was as skinny as Miss Blake was broad, with a long jaw and blonde hair piled upward into a cone that made her seem even taller. Though she seemed only in her twenties, she looked just as tough as Miss Blake. This is Joan Lee, Miss Blake said. She's one of Miss Lucy's new neighbors. In a small town, that seemed enough of an explanation, as if they knew already about the laundry. The teacher scrutinized me. How do you do? I am Miss Sims. She went to a cabinet and got a textbook. If you'll stop by here after school, I'll give you a list of makeup assignments. Half turning, she looked at the classroom and pointed to an empty desk in front of a red-haired girl in a navy midi blouse that was starched to a uniform sharpness. You can sit in front of Bernice. I saw a few of the girls smirk at that, though I couldn't see why. As Miss Blake left and Miss Sims went on with an English lesson, I went down the aisle, but all I could really see were eyes, 23 pairs of eyes watching me as if I were trying to walk along a tightrope rather than a floor. When Bernice grinned a welcome at me, it made all the freckles on her cheeks rise up like a flock of birds. Nervously, I tried to smile back as I slid in. The top of my desk made a long, thin little trowel for pencils and pens, and on the right side was a hole with a metal base where I could put an ink bottle. I did my best to take notes, but I'm afraid that I paid more attention to the other pupils than to Miss Sims. I was glad to notice that they weren't dressed any too differently from the students in the school that I had left, except that the girls seemed to fancy little pins, sailboats, flowers, and so on, and the boys didn't have their hair slicked back. I attributed that to the difference in taste between regions. 
and I figured that I could work up some pen at home. Bobby was very clever with a knife and a piece of wood, so I began drawing designs on my pad of paper rather than taking notes. I was relieved to see that the class was discussing a Shakespeare play that we had already read in my old school. The smart thing to do was keep quiet, watch the others, and do as they did. As Papa was fond of saying, the nail that sticks out gets hammered. Now, Miss Sims asked, what does the wherefore and wherefore art thou Romeo mean? She nodded to a brunette with sausage curls. Anne? Anne bit her lip. She wants to know where he is? Well, that's what everyone thinks, Miss Sims said, and began to survey the room for someone else to call on. My hand shot up, and when Miss Sims nodded towards me, I answered, Juliet is asking why he has to be called Romeo Montague. Why couldn't he be a smith? Exactly, Miss Sims said. It was nice for a change to do something right and have it acknowledged. At home, we could work all day, do everything we were supposed to, and not get one word of praise. We never heard what we did right, only what we did wrong. I don't think Mama and Papa knew what a compliment was, at least with their children. Anne, though, turned and shot a look at me that was pure poison. She obviously didn't like being shown up, but I just shrugged. I didn't think anything about it until the next period, which was physical education. In the locker room, the other girls changed into dark blue blouses and balloon-like pants called bloomers. It was similar to the outfit that I'd had to wear in Ohio, so I could bring it the next day. Fortunately, the physical education teacher, Miss Armstrong, had an extra one that I could borrow for that day. As we were changing, Anne glanced at me. You're a little dark, aren't you? I blinked. Looking down at the back of my hand, and I suddenly realized that she wasn't referring to my tan, but to my skin color. You're a little pale, aren't you? I shot back. Anne jumped to her feet. Miss Armstrong better burn that suit after you use it. I balled my hands in a fist when Miss Armstrong thrust herself between us. We don't tolerate that kind of talk in this school. One more peep from you, Anne Wood, and I'll turn you over to Miss Blake. Anne grew even paler at the thought of the principal. Yeah, yes, ma'am. Miss Armstrong shoved Anne towards the gymnasium. You can take out your energy in the gymnasium, she nodded at me. You too, Joan. Anne was waiting for me by the doorway as I left the locker room. As I crossed the threshold, she stuck out a foot and tripped me. (laughs) Poor dear, a little slow on your feet this morning. She reached down to help me up. I can do it myself, I said, and shook her off. Miss Armstrong saw only the final part of our little scene. "What What you two need to learn is a little teamwork. She was dressed in a larger size of our gymnasium clothes, except for the big silver whistle around her neck. Reaching for it now, she blew on it loudly. Volleyball, everyone! Our physical education teacher made a point of putting Anne and me on the same team. I think it was her idea to have us work together, but what it did was give Anne golden opportunities to slide up and bump, shove, and even trip me until by the end of the period I got so mad that I wound up throwing the volleyball at Anne. The instructor's whistle pierced the noise in the gymnasium. She grabbed me by the collar, lifting me slightly off the floor. That will be enough of that. You are to write 200 times, I will be a good sport, and I want that by tomorrow. Behind her, Anne made a face at me. I was still limping at lunchtime as I moved towards the fence, separating the grammar school playground from the high school. Bobby, a natural athlete, was already playing baseball with the other boys in his class. Emily was off in another part of the playground, skipping rope with some of the other girls in her class. I recognized the chant that they were using as one of Emily's. She was the creative one. I stood by the fence, waiting, wanting to call them over to have lunch with me, but they were doing so well that I knew I should just leave them alone. I sat down by myself, feeling ugly and stupid and lonely, and the more I saw of West Virginia, the more I wished that I were back in Ohio. What I hated most was that I felt so awkward. The worst thing was my hands. I didn't know what to do with them. Should I leave them at my side? Should I clasp them behind my back? Should I fold them in front of me? Opening my pad of paper, I began writing down the punishment assignment to occupy my mind until Emily and Bobby were ready to eat lunch. Suddenly, I sat with my own thoughts, and I felt a shadow across my face, and I glanced up to see Bernice. Mama wouldn't worry about her posture. Her spine was as straight as a pole, and she held up her head with what the magazines called a ladylike elegance. She spoke slowly, almost with a self-conscious diction. May I eat with you? The yes was almost on my lips when I remembered our lunches. I'm sorry, I I promised to eat with my brother and sister. Bernice started to sit down anyway. I can wait with you until they come, 
I put my hand on her hip to stop her. They're the shy type. They might not come over. Bernice froze there in a half crouch, her head swiveling around to look at the grammar school playground. I looked in the same direction and saw the same thing she did. The small Chinese boy and girl playing with the others and generally presenting the opposite picture of being shy. I braced myself for some storm of accusations, but Bernice just pressed her lips together firmly. Oh, um, I see. I almost relented, but Bernice might shame our family in front of the entire school, and from the school, it would spread over the whole town, and it didn't matter about me. However, Bernice could ruin everything for Bobby and Emily. Agonized, I knew I couldn't even explain my reasons at all. I'm sorry, I said, grasping the bag. Of, of course, Bernice said gravely, as if she were 20 years older. I understand. Understand what? I asked, puzzled. You will never be accepted by the others if you're seen with me. I watched her retrace her steps across the field. The funny thing was that she didn't go over to the benches where the other girls sat, chattering away as brightly as sparrows. Instead, she sat down on the concrete steps and began to eat by herself. Despite Mama's warning, I was feeling so curious that I almost went over to eat with her. But at that moment, Bobby and Emily showed up on the other side of the fence, both of them red-faced and out of breath from playing. Who are you talking to, Joan? Bobby asked. She looks like a girl in my class. It could be a sister? I answered as he plopped down. What do you know about her? Well, not much. Bobby crunched his sandwich noisily. Everybody avoids the girl in my class. Emily had the more spectacular imagination. I bet they're tied up in a feud. Bobby had all the superior knowledge of his extra two years. Don't be a goose. They live in town. Feuds are up in the hills. Emily corrected him. In a hollow. <laughs> well, they say it holler. Bobby corrected her back. Holler. Emily caressed the words against the roof of her mouth. And crick for creek, Bobby said. Never mind, I said, staring down at my sandwich. How was your day, Joan? Emily asked. I've made two new friends. For her sake, I smiled. Oh, that, that's nice. Um, so have I. Emily opened her lunch bag without thinking and reached inside. When she raised the sandwich into the open, she looked disappointed. Oh, I forgot. The sandwich sagged in one dirty fist as she looked through the mesh at me. Rabbit food is rabbit food. However, she ate her sandwich anyway with a loud crunching noise. I'm going to have supper at Janie's house. Were you invited? With Emily, you could never be sure. I will be, she asserted. Bobby dusted off his hands after finishing his sandwich. Don't, don't be a pig. What about Mama and Papa? That will leave more for them, Emily argued. But she spoke in a small voice as if she already knew that was a feeble excuse. I'll eat at home, Bobby promised. All right, Emily dipped her head reluctantly. I will too. She began looking around the playground for her friends. Maybe Janie has an apple or something that she can spare. When Bobby started to wad up his paper bag, I pointed at it urgently. Save it. Sheepishly, Bobby unfolded the ball of paper that he had made out of his lunch bag and folded it carefully. Emily simply slapped it flat and began to shove it through one of the spaces in the mesh. Here, you keep it for me. I looked at it and began to fold it carefully while an impatient Bobby just shoved his through another space and let it flutter to the grass. Race you, he shouted Emily. I snatched up Bobby's just before the wind sent it whirling away. And as I sat folding up paper old bags, I could hear the laughter and the happy shouts all around me, and I felt as if we were, I were trapped inside some sort of glass cage, cut off from the laughter and happy voices that surrounded me. Through the textbooks, though the textbooks were different, for those in Ohio, the subject matter was pretty much the same, so it wasn't really a question of catching up with the rest of the classes, only of doing the makeup assignments to show that I already knew the material. I felt as if the only people who approved of me were my teachers, so for the rest of the day, I went on answering questions, and for the rest of the day, I could hear whisperings and gigglings wherever I went. Apparently, the whole school had heard of the know-it-all girl, and since I detested whiny people, I hated myself even more for feeling sorry for myself. I suppose that when the starfisher's daughter had gone for a walk in their village, the neighbors had smirked in just the same way. Moving through the hallways, I felt as if I were marked by a drop of blood from a falling feather. So you can't imagine what relief I felt when I heard the final bell ring, and that meant I was free. I got the lists of makeup assignments from my teachers who, like Miss Sims, 
had prepared them by the end of the day. As I started to leave school with a pile of books, I saw Bernice's familiar erect spine ahead of me. Do you want to walk together? I asked. However, Bernice kept on moving out of the school. Bernice, I said in a louder voice. She turned slowly as if puzzled that anyone would call her, and then she saw me. Hello, she said timidly. I tried to grin as I repeated, Do you want to walk together? Bernice looked pretty when she smiled. That would be nice. I hope you don't mind if my little brother and sister come along. I began to walk out of the door. Bernice waited for me to join her. Her books held against her stomach. Each of them had been covered in brown paper, and on the fence of each was this su- on the face of each was the subject and her own address neatly inked in. I have a sister myself, she said. As Anne and another girl passed by, they glanced at us. It figures, one of them said, and the other put her fingers in front of her mouth and tittered, something I'd never seen anyone do before. I turned puzzled to Bernice, who was biting her lip. What do you think they meant? Bernice shook her head. Folks in this town are terribly clannish. We moved into town ten years ago and were still treated like strangers. Where do you come from? I asked, because her accent didn't sound like that of the others. On my father's side, Boston. Bernice waved a hand vaguely toward the east while clutching her books. But my grandmother moved into this area a while back. Her third husband's family was involved in oil, and he did not leave her much more than a house, though. Like everyone else, Bernice was disappointed to hear that we had come from an ordinary place like Ohio and not China. Whenever it happened, I felt like the starfisher's daughter. On the one hand, belonging to an ordinary world, and belonging to a strange exotic world, too, and one that I knew nothing about. But our parents are from China, I added hopefully. I just prayed that she didn't ask me any questions about that country because I knew uh, I knew as little as she did. However, Bernice looked at me now as if she suspected that I was playing some trick on her. Even though I went on chatting innocently enough, I could tell that Bernice was nervous about something. Being surrounded by all the other pupils made her almost as uncomfortable as me, or maybe it was being seen with me. Bobby and Emily were waiting by the gates to the high school. Emily's belly bulged suspiciously, as if she had something stored away under her sweater, whatever she could scavenge from her new friends. What took you so long? I ignored her rudeness, and I nodded towards Bernice. This is my friend Bernice. Bobby was lounging against the gate, as if he had had no bones. Josephine's sister? Yes, Bernice declared brightly. This is Bobby, I said to Bernice, and indicated my little sister. And this is Emily. How do you do? Emily said. Bobby wasn't being any different from the other boys, but Mama would never accept that posture. Taking him by his collar, I pulled him upright. How did George go? Did you have any trouble? I selected the words carefully because there were still other students around us. When I finished the introduction, someone giggled behind me. Bernice stiffened and I whirled around, but the three girls behind us were watching the antics of a little dog across the street in someone's front yard. By now, I was so sensitive to the sound of laughing that I was beginning to think that I was the target of it all. What's wrong? Bobby asked. N- nothing, I lied. Bernice, though, had gotten a funny look in her face. Maybe we shouldn't walk home. I could feel my face reddening as I thought. She doesn't want to be seen with me. However, I kept control of myself. Maybe not, I said, and forced myself to shrug as if it, I didn't care. Bernice stared at me, hurt. I didn't know why. After all, she was the one who had made the suggestion. I was thinking that you might like to look at my notes on some of the courses. Perhaps we could do some homework together later tonight, she asked in a small voice. I thought it was a little odd, considering that she didn't want to be seen walking with me, so I refused politely. Thank you, but we have chores. She looked so disappointed that I added, But why don't you give me your address? I peered at the address on one of her books. Oh, no, she said quickly, covering it up. I I'm, I'm meant at the library. Maybe so, I said, not really understanding why she was afraid to walk with me, but was willing to be seen with me at the library. Very well, pivoting on her heel, she plunged down the hill, shoes slapping the pavement. As I watched her back recede down the hill, Bobby scratched his head. What was that all about? Come on, let's go home. But as I walked, I couldn't help remembering the story from last night. I wondered if the starfisher's daughter had felt just as lonely in her village. And that's it. Don't forget to do your quiz.